では時間になりましたので、えー、午後のセッション、えー、最初のセッションは宗谷拓さんによる PSGI オーパンアンプロフィットですよろしくお願いします Thank you.、Um, so, first, I want to thank everyone that came. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for EAPSI Asia for bringing me here. And I would like to thank my translators there that are ready for me、um, and my rapid speech. So, I've warned them and I warn you if I am going too fast, please tell me. I make that mistake often. Okay, so.、Um, I would like to talk about PSGI and plaque for fund and profit, but mostly profit.、Um, before I do that, I actually want to introduce myself. Some of you might not know me. Consider yourself lucky. <laughs>、um, so, I work on Pearl at Booking. I wrote a few stuff, but mostly I maintain other stuff. So, Module Starter, Dancer, and Dancer 2. I wrote myself a bunch of really weird Pearl Bell plugins,、uh, WWWXKCD,、uh, which provides synchronous and asynchronous interface to XKCD. I wrote Acme Raffle Everywhere, please help. And I tend to yell, scream, and sometimes write some code. And yes, I do have to edit. So,、uh, what is this talk about, really? <laughs> So, what is this talk about really? First of all, I'm going to talk about PSGI as a protocol. I'm going to explain how it works and how you write with it. Then, I'm going to talk about plaque as utilities. Then, I'm going to talk about the kind of different、uh, business considerations that we have when we have a large infrastructure and how these tie in with PSGI and plaque. Starting with plaque, the first thing I want to say is that actually this is not new, but it is new to us. So if you take a look at Ruby, there is Rack, and in Python, there is、um, WSGI. And we basically borrowed it, Miyagawa san, from them, and now we have PSGI. And this is a wonderful quote by Picasso. And another artist took it and said, Oh, my, it's actually Bansky. And of course, you can see me at the end there. <laughs> so I'd like to start with, with how PSGI looks like. This is a normal、um, CGI esque, kind of like CGI、uh, structure, where you have the user, which usually I draw with a balloon, but my ASCII skills are not that good.、Um, and what we have is a server. Like Apache, you have a handler, and the handler helps mediate between the Apache representation and the way your web application will work in PSGI. You write your web application, you have the handler, and when a request comes in, the server uses the handler to conform this to PSGI, send it to this web application, which will return PSGI to the handler, which will then return it back to the server. Something you might be more used to is when we have these things together inside the web server. This is kind of like Mod Pearl, where what you have is the web server, which contains the Pearl interpreter calling a handler and calls the PSGI web app. The PSGI web app is actually just a callback, it's a function that you run. The handler allows you to translate how Apache sees a request and how PSGI sees a request. And the same thing with the response. So, what I want to show you is actually this callback, how it looks like, how you write a web application in PSGI. So,、um, when we take a look at PSGI, an actual example, it kind of looks like this you have your code reference. It receives the environment variables that will contain stuff like information about the request, the parameters, the method, the path, all that information. And afterwards, we will return a response which will include the HTTP status, any headers that we have in pairs, and the content, which can be either a string 
or some file handle. This is an example of a more advanced response, which we are not all used to. This is actually something called a delayed response. That is when you want to take more time to return this, but you don't want to block the user until you have the response content. So what you do is instead of returning the response, you say, I'm going to return a function, and that will return the response. So we return a sub, and that sub will receive a callback that you can feed the response when you have it. So if we have some kind of request that goes to a server, it takes longer to run, and it has a callback when it's done and it receives the content, we can then call the responder callback and provide the information. You'll notice that this one is the same as, sorry, the same as this one. Same thing. This just allows you to return it later, not right now. There is yet one more um, response type, which is even more advanced, streaming. It looks like this. We return sub again. And in this case, we know what the headers will be, we know what the status code is, but we want to return the content in a non-buffering streaming manner. So what we will do is we will send the responder only the HTTP status and the headers, and that's it. Then we get a writer object that we can call whenever we have more content. So we incrementally feed the user more content. Streaming. When we are done streaming, we will just close the socket. And that's good. That's it. So now that we understand how PSGI looks as a protocol, and we can now write PSGI applications, I want to talk about Plaque. Now, Plaque has a lot of components. I'm going to talk about the major ones. PSGI uh, as a PSGI toolkit. We have the handlers, which are the adapters to web servers. We have the runner, which is just a command line to run PSG applications. We have middlewares that provide wrappers for additional functionality. And we have the builder, which is just a nice language to enable these middlewares. And of course, there's a lot of testing capabilities for Plaque. So starting with handlers, the first one on the list. Handlers are the web server adapter and they connect our PSGI apps with our web servers. An example would be the handlers for Apache 1 and 2. Or if you don't want a specific server, you can talk about uh, a specific um, uh, C-based server. You can talk about Pro-based servers, web servers like Starman or Twiggy. They have their own handlers. Or you can talk about just protocols like CGI or FastCGI. And you can use these handlers to run your PSGI code as CGI. The next one is the runner. Basically, just the ability to start a PSGI piece of code. So this would start an app that is defined in Hello PSGI. This will default to App PSGI. There's some options that you can give. And if you want to learn more about these, you should just read Plaque App Help. The next one is middlewares. Middlewares are these wrappers around your app. And these wrappers provide additional functionality without affecting the app. The app doesn't know about them, which is a good thing. There are three things that a middleware can do. A middleware, when it receives a request, it can decide to change the request. For example, it can add a header. It can change the path. The second thing a middleware can do is decide whether to pass it on in the chain to the next middleware or app, and can decide to return right away and not send it forward. The third thing is to change the response that it receives. So if a middleware takes the first request, sends it along, eventually it will reach the app, which will return a response, 
And then each middleware can even change that response to add more things to the response. A few examples of middlewares, just to put this in context, is middleware rewrite. It allows you to rewrite paths just like mod rewrite in Apache. And then you carry your rewrites even if you're not using Apache. There's middleware cache, which allows you to add caching without your app knowing or caring about it. Middleware debug actually injects HTML and JavaScript to the response to provide you with these menus that you can use to debug your application. Reverse proxy, which is an advanced functionality, fully available as a middleware. And auth basic, which I find fascinating to provide you with authentication, which is defined in the middleware. So you're not dependent on a specific implementation. You provide your own. This is how we would use the plaque builder to define middlewares. So we have our app, and then we call builder, and we say enable a middleware. We can also enable middleware with some options if we want. At the end, we will put our app in. This is an example with a few actual middlewares. There's rewrite, and then we provide options on the rewrite rules. Auth basic, we can provide an authenticator, which is our own function. And static, which will provide static files from the uh, four paths that we define from this root. At the end, we have our app. And of course, testing. If we use plaque test, HTTP request common, we can then define an app. This app just returns hello. That's it. And then we define a test object using this app that we created. And then we can make a request using the get function that we get from HTTP request common. And we can check the content that we receive back. What this will do is fake an entire HTTP server. You don't have to start a server to run a fake request. It does all of that for you, which is very, very cool. So summarizing this, PSGI and Plaque, they are really, really, really great. We know this. Um, it is a simple yet very powerful protocol which allows us to standardize the two ends of a web server and web um, application. So on one hand, we have the frameworks and the web applications. On the other hand, the servers. And there is now a standard for both and how they interact. Because there's a standard, this means that we can write really, really, really cool web frameworks. We can write really cool web servers. We are not bound to Apache. We're not bound to Lighty. We're not bound to Nginx. We can write our own. But the question is, if you are a big company or if you are any company that has a large infrastructure, is that good enough? Oftentimes, we provide a new technology and say, OK, here's a really nice technology, but a business can't necessarily use it. It is not good enough to use the word cool. That's, that's not enough. If you are a startup, that is not a problem because you go for cool. If you are hacker news, this makes money. But if you are not hacker news, if you are a big company, you have to account for more than just cool. So I think it all boils down to the B word, which is business. You see, when we think about using a technology, we actually have to account for our business, what we will use it for, and how it will affect the company. Will it cause us losses? Will we gain money from it? Why do we want to use this new technology? Now, there's a few things that business kind of implies. When we talk about stuff that happens in large infrastructures that we consider sins, things that you should never, ever do, but they happen, and there's a reason they happen. It's important to know this. For example, rewriting and refactoring. These are things that we're always sure that will never happen um, in a big company or in a large infrastructure. And these are things that some of us think we should always do, but that's not true. A business 
has to balance between these two. So if you have a feature or let's say a fix that you want to put in a piece of code and the code is very ugly, it might take you two whole days because it is really bad code and you want to rewrite it or you want to refactor it. So next time it will not take two days, it will take 10 minutes. If the refactoring will take two or three months, is it worth your time? Two days versus two months? So it's very important to understand the implication of rewriting or refactoring. This doesn't mean you don't. It means that you have to have judgment on when you do. Sometimes it is very important to rewrite. Sometimes it is very important to refactor. Not always. It really depends and you have to exercise judgment. And that's something that a business has to do. <coughs> One thing that we always forget, unless we work at a company with a very large infrastructure or a lot of code, is that code that makes you money can be deleted. If you're a startup, you can start from scratch every time because you, because you haven't amassed a lot of code. You don't have this big pile of code. But if you're a big company or if you're a long-lasting company or if you have a large infrastructure, you will have a lot of code and that code makes money and you can delete it. If you come in with a new technology and you say, okay, look at this, it's cool, let's use it. It's not good enough. If you have to delete everything, you can't use it. And that's something we have to remember if we are to be responsible programmers. Setups, most importantly, actually cost us money. A lot of money. A lot of money. This is something that we refer to as externalized costs. People think that, okay, I'm willing to rewrite everything. Oh, that's great. What about sysadmins? What about DBAs? What about the infrastructure that you have for deploying your code, for rolling back your code, for running KVMs, the entire system that you need. This also costs you money, quite a lot. More importantly, if you bring in a new technology, it will cost you more money to change your setup. And the question is, what would it take to be productive again? If now I'm productive with my setup and I need to change it, how long do I have until I am again productive? So when we take a look at PSJ and Plaque, and we know it's very, very cool, could we actually use it when we take into account code base that we have, a setup that we have, and all these considerations that a business has to do? So I'm going to give a use case of when a company with a large infrastructure takes a look at Plaque and PSJ. And I will use Booking.com as an example. <clears throat> so to put some numbers into this. Booking.com currently serves over 533,000 accommodations, mostly hotels. It is available in more than 205 countries. That's a lot. That's a lot. Currently, the average room nights that are booked every 24 hours is over 700 thousand. We have over 35 million guest reviews. Over 8,000 people work at Booking. We support 42 languages. 42. How many websites do you know that support these many languages? We have over 600 people in IT. Over 600. A lot of them are developers. We have over eight core Perl developers, people from P5P. We are probably the only company that hires, or the company that hires the most core dev, core Perl devs. So it's a very large infrastructure, large scale company. The challenges that we deal with are really big. I, I don't know if I said that. We're actually hiring. <laughs> if you want to join us, come see us later. We would love to talk to you. Now, I was looking for a comparison. I found this website that you might know. 
and it has 18,000 hotels in Ryukan. And in comparison, Booking has over 533,000. Now you could talk about this website is only in Japanese, it's only in, for Japan, um, but we did find it in .com in English. Um, and we can talk about how, well, how much business does Booking do in Japan, information that honestly I don't even know. But it gives you some estimate of the biggest website that you know that handles with accommodations. It's not even close to what Booking has. And more importantly is the code base for Booking. For a company that is not an IT company, we do a lot of IT. So, Booking has a massive code base. Massive. Millions of lines of code. We have around 8,000 modules. If we actually separated them even more, we could top 10,000. Easy. Booking also has a lot of history. It was established in 1996, which is a long time ago. This means that while we have new code, we actually have some code that depends on old frameworks. For example, we have code that uses class DBI. People look at this and they say, why not DBIX class? Well, if you take a look at when D class DBI started and when booking started, when we started using class DBI, we already had a few years of development. We were older than the average startup. When uh, DBX class started, it was 2005. Nine years of booking code. Some of our code, not all of our code, but some of our code uses Mason. Mason was started in 1998. We already had two years of web programming. Some of our code uses HTML template, which was started in 1999. More interestingly, I think, that is that some of our code actually relies on specific servers and specific systems and specific platforms. For example, we have code that assumes that you have Apache, which was started again in 1995. Not, you know, it was the new kid on the block. Some of our code assumes, relies on Mod Perl. I don't know if ModPerl started in 2000, but that's the first email on their mailing list, February 2000. So it is important to realize that while it's not all of our code base, some of our code base relies on this. And it's code that makes money, a lot of money. And we can't ignore it. We can't delete it. If we want to use PSGI Plaque, first of all, we need a good reason. Second of all, we can't delete this. We need this. So what kind of options does a large infrastructure actually provide? First of all, we can rewrite everything from scratch. We can write the new stuff in new frameworks. And we can just forget about it and stay sad forever. So rewriting from scratch. That means that we will have a substantial downtime. Or we will hire at least two and a half to three times as many developers because some of them, half, will rewrite all the old stuff. Half of them will write along current developers that are writing on the old system. So you have new system and old system continually developing new stuff and about the same amount rewriting the old stuff. And this would be tricky because the current developers already assume on things that haven't been rewritten yet. It's a problem. Of course, you would also have to account for uh, all the tools and the setups that we have. You would have to rewrite all of those. So it really is impossible when you think of this. The um, second option is writing all the new stuff in new frameworks. So you would have to have multiple environments you would have to have multiple frameworks, or you could have multiple frameworks. You would need a lot of compatibility layers that clean up, check up, fix up everything in between the old code and the new infrastructure, and have a lot of emulation, mocking, faking, wherever it assumes on something or relies on it. But this will give you simultaneous development. That means that you would be able to develop new stuff 
and maintain old stuff. And you could continue to develop the old systems and add features at the same time, which is crucial. This means that you would not have downtime and you won't have to double or triple the number of developers that you have. Remember, at Booking, we have over 600 IT people. How about tripling that? How long will that take? Quite a while. Now, um, this would be very difficult. I'm going to explain a little bit, I hope, by the time I have left. Of course, there's the third option. And I was looking at the third option because I thought it would only be fair to share and look into this. So I searched this, I looked it up, and basically it means that it would be boring, it would be depressing, and it would not be a very good tech talk. <laughs> so I decided not to do this. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so the question is, for a big company that has all this code, how do you go beyond Apache, um, Mod Pro, and Mason? Now, I should note, we want to go beyond Apache and beyond Mod Pro but we want to still have our Mason bits. We want to be able to continue developing the bits that are already in Mason. How do we do that? This is the direction that we picked. This is our stack. We have Nginx, we have MicroWSGI, which I heard some people call Whiskey. We have our internal PSGI apps, it could be our internal stuff, it could be frameworks, for example, Dancer and Dancer 2. We emulate a lot, we mock a lot, we fake, check, fix, improve, all these things in between the old system and the new one. And at the end, we have a durable, decoupled divergence, which means that you can think of it as streams of production, where some of these streams lead to Mason, some of these streams lead to different frameworks. And all of this is at the same time, decoupled from each other, and long lasting, which is very, very important. This is an illustration. We have our web server. This is a simplified illustration. We have our web server, which leads to our PSGI app, which we wrap with middlewares. And that PSGI app leads to additional apps. The app could be written with Mason, we will use a plaque handler. We will add a layer of compatibility with PSGI for Mason. And we can, if we want, wrap it with more middlewares. We can then diverge to another place where maybe we run Dancer 2, which we do for some things. And maybe we want to wrap that with middlewares. And we can also go to a different place that might have an internal app that we wrote without any framework. And we can wrap that with middlewares if we want. And all of that could be wrapped with middlewares. And this is what I mean by decoupled divergence. When you go in, you could go to either direction, and each one exists at the same time and can be developed simultaneously at the same time. A developer can work on this, while a developer works on this, while a developer works on this. This is not a problem. And the best thing is that this is durable. This code that we don't necessarily like, we don't have to delete, ever. It just works at the same time. So this is what we do. But I thought that maybe just showing this wouldn't necessarily be that interesting. I thought of one nice bonus for you. And it is showing you a few tricks that we do with plaque. So this is our booking plaque bag of tricks. So first of all, we do a lot of preloading before we fork our processes. So if we have our builder that generates that massive app that I showed, before we serve it to the server, which then forks, we load a few things into memory. So we have a lot of classes that just help preload depending on what we want to do in this, in this uh, server, and we will import stuff from it and preload it. One thing that we do use um, MicroWSGI for is our asynchronous cleanup. So when we want to do cleanups on a request, we can return the response to the user, close the connection, and run the cleanups in the background asynchronously. So we don't take time from the user. 
When you get a response from us, that's it. We will handle everything else. So you don't have to worry. And you don't have to wait. And that is very important. It's very useful. as something we use PSGI for. And if more servers implement this extension, that means that we could use other servers if we want. We use the authenticator, the basic, uh, off basic that I showed, to provide authentication based on what the server does. So if you're reaching a certain server that maybe handles an API, then we can do the authentication on a specific database. Maybe we're using LDAP for this. Maybe we're using our own credentials at work for this because it's an internal website. Maybe you were using this database that is associated with those kind of users. We can decide where we go to authenticate. So we can decide on different authentications for different server types. Of course, there's one thing that I really like about our authentication, which is this thing. I don't know how many of you know bash.org. <laughs> this is someone fooling someone to share uh, uh, how to share his password. So he basically says, just put it, it'll just show his stars, he put it. <sighs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> so we decided that this is a good password. And if you are using a development environment, this password will work. Now, the reason that we have this in development environment is that maybe you want to write something from the command line and you need to put in your password because it has authentication. You don't want to put in your actual password on the command line. You don't want to share your actual password. So if you're using a development environment, which is your basically, you basically your KVM, you could put in sad hash as your password, you can put in hunter2 as your password, or if you prefer the encrypted version, you can use seven stars. My favorite trick is something we call Sanity Destroyer. It was written by Ivar, who actually wrote a bunch of these things as well. It looks like this. What it does is, and mind you, the description, would it use this package name if you had the chance? What it actually does is something very interesting. It has a constructor which sets the state to a new state. Then when the object is destroyed, basically going out of scope, it will set it to a destroyed state. And there is one method to actually check what is the state. Now, why would we do this? Well. When we get a new request, in the environment hash that we get from Plaque, from the PSGI protocol, we insert the object with a reset state. Then later on, when we get requests, we can check, wait, was it destroyed or not? Since we know it will be destroyed when it goes out of scope, which happens when we finish a request and clean up everything, if this fails, it means that we have a memory leak. This allows us to monitor memory leaks live. This is very powerful. And this allows us to find memory leaks not just in our code, but in frameworks that we use. So if you have a memory leak and we use your stuff, we can find it and we will fix it. So, I'd like to conclude. Plaque, when we take a look at as a technology for a business with large infrastructure, it provides us with a durable decouple divergence, which provides us with flexibility. That provides us with adaptability. We can adapt to new technologies. 
This gives us a migration path. So if we want to move away some of the bits that are written in, say, Mason or in something older, uses maybe Mod Perl, we can do that. And we can do that at our own pace. We don't have to hurry. And at the end, it allows us to innovate, to continue to create new things and not sit down with, oh, this is old, we're stuck with it, and that's it, which is what a lot of companies use. And well, the, that's the situation a lot of companies have. But we don't have this. If, you're gonna write, if you want to write new stuff, you can. Just write it. Oh, there's Mason? Don't worry about it. And of course, because it's free, I would say it is a reasonable price. So I think a good summary that I would have for development and the process of development is that development is moving forward without forgetting the past. We're able to continue to move forward with new technologies and new products and new ideas and we're not stuck on what we had from 1996. It all just works. Kind of the summary, I guess, for this entire talk. And the last thing is that I would like to thank you for sitting down and listening to this. Now, I know it is not customary to ask questions, but I would appreciate it and I would thank you if you were to ask any questions you might have. Please. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 oh, great. Uh, get this thing. Okay, so why are we using Perl and not another language? Did, is that a good description? Okay. So, yeah, so why didn't we change to another language? Um, the problem that we have is a problem that exists in every language. If you look at Ruby, if you look at Python, if you look at any other language that exists for more than one year, they all have this problem where you set up an infrastructure and now there's a new thing. And you can't move away from the old infrastructure. I know companies that have it with Ruby, I know companies that have it with Python. This is not a language problem. This is technology problem. That's why companies in general have a problem with moving away from something. Think of Red Hat Linux, for example. So moving to another language wouldn't fix it. We would have it again, just with another language. Additionally, we actually really like Perl. It is a very strong language. It is elastic and it's fast. You can do really crazy stuff with it, which we do. So we, we would like to use Perl, but use it wisely and go beyond the problems that any language would have. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Does anyone have any other question? Thank you for your message. Yeah, um, in your slide, I, uh, you, you, your article just shows uh, some router like uh, PSG applications, and behind it, uh, some, some uh, one, one is good, uh, new, and uh, some, some is old the application. Uh, how do you uh, connect between the router like application and the uh, other behind the applications, 
in, in like uh, and like like brutal practice or API testing or how you communicate with brutal like apps and button apps? That is an excellent question. Um, basically, it depends on what that application is. If it is, for example, Dancer, which we use for some things, we will actually create a PSGI app from the Dancer app and dispatch with the environment. If it's a different application, we might use a compatibility layer and then dispatch as if it's Mod Pearl. Um, so it might be objects. It really depends on what that is. And that's why, I guess that's why it's a good question because it's not a simple, necessarily only one way. It depends. So we will use whatever method we need, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much.